Okay. So thank you, first of all, for all of you joining in and for those of you who are watching after, thank you so much for participating in our first virtual Meet the Author event for the brand new Barnegat Bay Book Club, uh, which is hosted by Save Barnegat Bay. We put it together in hopes to keep everyone connected to Barnegat Bay topics in this time of being uh, in our homes more often. So uh, our first book is Close Sea, which we're gonna talk all about. And my name is Grace Ann Taylor. I should tell you that too. Uh, I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Save Barnegat Bay. And Save Barnegat Bay has been around for 48 years. We're a nonprofit, non-government organization. And we started around the kitchen table trying to protect land in Brick Township. And in that 48 years, we've been able to pass legislation um, to curb fertilizer use. Uh, we've been able to help protect land and uh, stop overdevelopment. And now uh, obviously our story grows and we're working on education and advocacy. So uh, Barnegat Bay is loved by all of us or else we wouldn't be here. This is probably one of the coolest Barnegat Bay parties we'll all have on a Zoom meeting. Uh, but Barnegat Bay is the largest body of water in the state of New Jersey. So by rights, it has a lot of people that love it. Uh, it goes all the way from Bay Head or the head of the bay, all the way down to Little Egg Harbor. And on average, it's six feet deep and uh, it's about 41 miles long. So obviously there are shorelines on the beach and on the bay side that all of us um, enjoy. And of course, don't forget about the watershed that all that water drains across our watershed all the way out from Jackson and into the bay. So all of the people, almost everyone that lives in Ocean County lives within the Barnegat Bay watershed. So uh, I was uh, in the office trying to decide what the first book might be uh, for the Barnegat Bay Book Club and I was already halfway through Close Sea. So by complete chance, I picked Close Sea as our first book for the Barnegat Bay Book Club, not even knowing what kind of impact it had had on the watershed throughout the years of it having been around. So uh, today we have the pleasure of having Ke Dr. Kent Mountford here with us to speak about his book. And um, I just want to, before I introduce Kent, I just want to put a plug in for the publisher who happens to be a local small business and uh, is located, I believe, on LBI. Uh, they're called Down the Shore Publishing. So if you haven't had the chance to pick up Kent's book or any other local books, please check them out. Uh, they would love your support. They're still shipping even though their doors are closed right now. Um, so uh, enough about all that housekeeping. Uh, I would like to introduce Kent because he has a huge re uh, resume. Uh, he's an estuarine ecologist and has spent many years, almost 40 years, studying estuaries uh, in the Chesapeake Bay area. And he studied plankton and his work has contributed to the Chesapeake Bay and programs to help improve it. And Kent has spent both uh, you know, time on the Chesapeake Bay, but also has been sailing for his entire life on the Barnegat Bay. So obviously this was the, one of the best choices for a first book because we have um, an amazing person who not only has the historical side to, uh, to tell, but also the, the ecology side of the story to tell. So. Thank you, Kent, for being here and for speaking on your book. And of course, um, because at the beginning, I just I know people are going to turn tune off. I just want to make sure that we uh, have a shout out to Terry O'Leary, who I hope has tuned in by now. Uh, he was one of the driving forces at the very beginning. Kent will talk about his, the work he did with him to get the book published. So thank you to Terry O'Leary and to um, Carol. Uh, her last name is Carol Campbell and the Ocean County Historical Society for also being a huge part of the book publishing process. Again, Kent will talk all about that. So um, without further ado, Kent, please take it away and, um, and introduce yourself and then I will ask you the first question. And then if anyone has other questions as we go, just throw them in the chat. Well, I don't need to introduce myself. You've just done a wonderful job of that. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, um, this book um, um, started when I was a kid in college. And um, um, well, actually it started a few years before that when my father bought the beautiful cat boat, Salamade. And that was our family home during the summer months, usually from about March until November um, of every season. And um, I started rowing around the bay in my little rowboat and 
found all these interesting things growing uh, on the edge of the marsh and swimming in the water and whatnot. And I said, Bonnie at Bay, it's just the coolest thing. So interesting. But when I was uh, asked to do a term paper in college, I, uh, I selected the aquatic life of Barnegat Bay. And I wrote this very heartfelt, um, long, color illustrated term paper. And uh, the guy, his name was Dr. Ayers, a Rutgers University professor. So if you have any misspellings in there, correct them because if you don't have those misspellings, misspellings corrected, I will fail you. And he failed this heartfelt work of mine. I was just crushed. He didn't pay any attention to the content. He simply failed me. So he was within his rights. He'd warned us. But I was so angry about that that I began to really devote most of my college career to researching Barnegat Bay and its history. And that's where the book came from. Um, every term paper I did during my college career was somehow bent to meet Barnegat Bay needs. Um, ecology, uh, and I didn't have any ecology in those days, it's just science didn't exist. But um, I did uh, papers on the economics of the fisheries and uh, you know, sociology and all the different things that I studied in college. And eventually sewed all those together with a lot of editing help and produced the book by about 1963, I think. So um, that's where it came from. It was really an act of anger that turned into a work of love. So you you covered so you covered the first two questions. What inspired you to write closely, and of course, when the book was written? Um, can you talk about that um, amazing story of how it got published and the people that went into publishing it? Because that is that's kind of awesome, and a lot of people on are actually a part of that process. Well, as a graduate of Rutgers University, um, it was logical for me to submit it to Rutgers University Press. They immediately declined to publish it. And somewhat later, I resubmitted it because then they said, well, we don't publish these local books. They just don't have a big enough market. They're just not a wide enough interest. Of course, they do now. There are scores of them that they put out that were based on, uh, based on various kinds of local history and, and local politics and what have you. So uh, many, many years later, when they were putting together the museum at Tuckerton, um, I met Terry O'Leary, I said, this is really cool, you know, really doing a nice job putting this little museum together. And um, I said, you know, I wrote a book on Barnegat Bay and it never got published. So he said, well, let me look at it. So I made him a Xerox copy of it. You know, when Xerox was fairly rare in those days, talking, talking decades ago now. It cost me a good bit of money to have it Xeroxed. And he thought it was really pretty cool. And that's where the actual impetus came and he networked with the um, Ocean County Historical Society and Carolyn Campbell, uh, then a retired um, educator, um, was uh, the head of their publications committee. And uh, she was really one of the spearheads to help put the book together. And we approached Down the Shore Publishing and Ray said, well, if they've got a little money, um, we could probably publish it. And he did. And there have been, uh, been rough little book sales ever since. And it's accumulated hundreds and hundreds of copies going out. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, publishing, well, that many years ago, um, was really not the same industry that it is today. And color was extremely expensive. And the book that I wrote had color illustrations at the beginning of every chapter. Most of the illustrations that are in the book today were also in color. And uh, um, none of that could appear in the book. So um, that's one of the losses that comes from uh, the earlier years of public publication. Subsequently, um, color printing can be done quite directly. It's only the cost of the ink. And computers, which literally didn't exist in those days, um, uh, you know, it's just much, much easier to publish a book with a lot of color and a lot of pictures. So kudos to, uh, to Terry. I really haven't seen him in years. And I probably never had a chance to really thank him um, thoroughly enough for how much of a help he was. Back to you, Grace Ann. I You're muted back. myself because I was clicking around. I uh, know, um, I wondered how you, you'd <laughs> left us. She dozed off to sleep, actually. <laughs> Most of people probably have that happen. Um, so those of you who don't know, Terry O'Leary is um, a local naturalist 
He worked for many years at the Forest Resource Education Center, and before that he worked at the Tuckerton Seaport and had probably many more things that I couldn't even speak on his resume. So um, he is also a, a legend in our community of someone who obviously finds people like Kent and supports their work and just encourages the stories to be told. Um, so there was a sequel planned, right, Ken? And yes. you were inspired to write that. So tell us about, tell us about well, that. Well, the basic interest in the bay came from its natural organisms. And I said, I thought, you know, the fisheries were here and these wonderful little shrimp were swimming about. I should do a second volume on the aquatic life of the estuarine life of Barnegat Bay. And um, I realized as I got into this back in the early 60s, I hadn't the vaguest idea about that stuff. I'd read some of the old classic literature and read some of the new, um, you know, identification manuals and things like that. But I really had no, no idea how to write a book about marine biology. So I'm not for that reason, but uh, for a variety of other reasons, I went back to graduate school again at Rutgers and uh, began to study marine science. And the major I had was actually in the Department of Botany, thanks to a wonderful professor who said, your work is good, I'll take it on and we'll, we'll you know, let you work towards your degrees. But um, my interest was much broader than marine botany. It was um, very broadly into marine zoology and plankton biology and the oceanography that went into, uh, into really describing how, the jet, how Barnegat Bay worked. So I went on, I had four years, wonderful years in graduate school, part of which uh, my wife Nancy came out of as a, she was a technician in our laboratory and we uh, took it from there. And we've been married, I think it's 49 years now. So uh, good times. But anyway, um, I came out and by the time I was out of graduate school, I was given a job in the Chesapeake Bay and that consumed my life for many years. And um, that's where my career went. So um, I guess let's talk a little bit about your career. Tell us about, I'm, I'm really curious to learn about the marine science that you, you know, partook. I mean, you studied plankton and you helped write a plan to help protect the Chesapeake. So can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it all started in Barnegat Bay because I did my doc master's and doctoral research in Barnegat Bay, looking at the plankton, the microscopic life in the bay. And this fascinated me. I, I started with a $7 microscope as a young man and uh, looked at plankton and tried to figure out what were these phosphorescent uh, little animalcules that floated around in the water in the summertime. So that, that's what started me on the marine science thing. But I became a plankton biologist and I studied the effects of the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant on plankton. And to do that, I did a couple of years of research looking at the seasonality and the way the organisms change from month to month and year to year, how the populations of animal plankton and plant plankton interacted. Among them, uh, these wonderful creatures was uh, jellyfish. And uh, there were no jellyfish like our friend, the uh, Chrysiora in those days. I see Paul Bologna is in the, uh, in the mix of people here too. He's been the sea nettle king, he and his two lovely technicians. But um, we had Nemeopsis, which is the uh, comb jelly, the ones that are luminescent. If you sail or motorboat in Barnegat Bay, they're the things that come out behind the transom as big puffs of light. Wonderful creatures. They're very heavy predators on uh, a large number of the uh, um, shellfish larvae and uh, other small organisms in the bay. But um, that started me and, and I found a uh, mm. organization that was interested in this work, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia. And I received from uh, Ruth um, Patrick, who's one of the early women scientists in North America. She hired me to do the same kind of work in Chesapeake Bay. And we worked chiefly around the power plants of Chesapeake Bay and studied the effects of those power plants just as I had done in, uh, in Barnegat Bay. And um, it went on from there. I went into the private sector for a while, ran a toxicology laboratory up in Rockville, Maryland. Most horrible commute anyone could ever imagine. It was a, an hour and a half each way every day. I cried the first day I got home from that job. Just crushing. But whatever the case, um, I went on from there and eventually entered the District of Columbia government and developed a monitoring program for the uh, tidal portion of the Potomac River. And uh, that with my colleagues was uh, something that's still going on. 
Um, when the Chesapeake Bay program restoration effort began, um, there was a large federal grant to stu study Chesapeake Bay. Since I'd been working on the Bay for more than a decade, um, that was a logical place for me to have some input. And eventually I joined the uh, US EPA Chesapeake Bay program, which is the chief um, organizational uh, device through which we've tried to restore Chesapeake Bay for uh, the monitoring program has gone on more than a third of a century. So it's one of the largest and oldest monitoring programs probably in the world. So that's where I came from. I retired from EPA 20 years ago and I write and I lecture and uh, still alive with COVID-19 in the picture. Well, that, that's a relief. Um, really quick, um, can you touch on the, the main issue that Chesapeake suffers that's congruent to the Barnegat Bay and in, in that? Yeah, well, again, it's the same issue that Willie has focused on for uh, Barnegat Bay, nitrogen pollution. Um, freshwater uh, algae blooms and problems with um, marine aquatic life in the freshwater parts of the estuary are usually uh, controllable with phosphorus removal and uh, phosphorus removal from wastewater plants, from farming, from municipal waste, from um, just the kinds of things we do like fertilizing our lawns um, is a real problem in freshwater. But when you control the phosphorus in freshwater, the nitrogen that's in wastewater, and it's a much larger, more uh, harmful component of wastewater and runoff, that goes down into the saltwater part of the estuary. And in the saltwater part of the estuary, the plankton that's living there waiting for food is limited by the amount of nitrogen that in a natural system comes down the normal pure rivers. When it gets the um, nitrogen from the wastewaters and runoff that we have, it goes crazy. So the Chesapeake had tremendous amounts of plankton that developed from roughly the 1950s up through the mid 1980s. And it took us a long time to convince the Environmental Protection Agency to control nitrogen as part of the strategy to improve Chesapeake Bay. And that was one of our biggest, uh, biggest leverages when we finally got to the agricultural community, the wastewater community, federal financing and whatnot to remove both nitrogen and phosphorus. So some of the plants in the Chesapeake now do a better job than, than the actual rivers and they leave a clear spot in the rivers, which is very costly, but it's an extremely part, extremely important part of the contribution to bringing Chesapeake Bay back. So uh, we got a little bit away from the book, which is totally fine, um, but I wanna steer back a little bit for those people that did read Closed Sea um, and talk about the industry or time period that was your favorite to tell. One of my favorites is just that layering of all the different industries and time periods and how they blended at times, but also stood out alone. So can you talk about which ones were your favorite to tell and what the process of doing that research was like? Well, um, a large part of the research was done in, the, uh, in what was called the special collections at the Rutgers University Library. And they had a, um, extremely wide collection of very early uh, literature and many, many books on uh, New Jersey, its history and um, its problems. Um, that everything from back to uh, uh, mental illness, to uh, farming problems, to oyster culture problems, to the history of the marine life that was figured out in the 19th century and many, many things from the colonial period. And that was an extremely valuable uh, set of information for me. Um, I also got into uh, some of the resources available in Ocean County. And there are wonderful books like Pauline Miller's History of Ocean County. <clears throat> and um, uh, I think it was John Wilson's History of the New Jersey Shore. And these are my primary tools when I put the book together. I was a pretty shy young guy and I missed interviewing and meeting many of the people that had a real role in the history of Barnegat Bay. And um, I'm sorry I did that, but I was very shy and just didn't know how to approach going out um, into the community and, and dealing with people. I did meet a lot of them, but um, not enough. It would have been a better book. Well, you did talk about, um, you know, kind of the story of the lifesavers that you 
that you felt really connected to? Yes, and that was really cool. Um, since then, I've met people, a number of people who've read the book, and their families were members of the life-saving community, the people who actually went out and rescued so many people during the uh, terrible storms that occurred. Um, I think they had some more storms than we have in the 19th century, and certainly before historical records were um, kept, um, and before the life-saving service, there were some amazing, uh, amazing people out there who who rescued many, many folks. Um, you asked what my favorite part of the book is. I spent some time thinking about that. And I think the one that touched me most deeply is uh, the one where I tried to find things about the very earliest times in Barnegat Bay. The early contact period when Europeans came, something about the Native Americans that are not as well understood in, the, uh, in New Jersey history as they are in the Chesapeake where we have active Native American tribes that are currently um, speaking about their own history and stimulating a lot of, um, a lot of research into the history of Native American um, communities and lifeways. But that part interested me. It's probably one of the weakest parts of the book, but because of my interest in the, uh, in the early history, it, it was something I reached out to in the Chesapeake and that's how I became essentially a Chesapeake historian and participated in a, several, two, three books that are uh, um, pretty seminal in Chesapeake history. So, so that, that's probably the thing that touched me most. The, so the, um, the next thing I had for you, which kind of is a perfect segue, is what would you like people to have for a takeaway if they read Close C? Well, um, try to bring it back that the bay is not what it was even when I was a kid. Um, there have been some, some changes that people like Willie DeCamp have brought about with his efforts. And um, certainly many, well, Paul is working, Paul Bologna is working on his side of it where we have this jellyfish problem, which I may have brought up here on my own sailboat. You know, the, uh, uh, I've come to the chest, from the Chesapeake to Barnegat Bay many times. And I always wondered if the pops for those damn things were on the bottom of my boat during one of my trips. Terrible thought, you know, it's like being the carrier of coronavirus. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm, I know there's a lot more that contributed to the change in the ecology of the bay than you bringing your sailboat up. <laughs> but uh, Nancy's jumping on um, and wants to show the cover of your book. Uh, so if she, I invited her to... to um, Maybe that's not a very good picture, you know. or you can see the boat on it, but let me bring it up too. There you go. This is probably, you put it out in your, uh, <clears throat> in your notice for the, uh, notice for the meeting. <clears throat> yes. It's interesting, the Garvey on the cover of the book is one of the traditional um, small craft of Barnegat Bay, probably um, was actually, uh, you know, created in Barnegat Bay. And uh, this Garvey is actually from the of Rutgers University Oyster Laboratory on Delaware Bay, the one that uh, has done so much work on the uh, Delaware Bay oysters. So that's enough of the title. But the, um, the, the Garvey was invented by Jer Jervis Faro, if I remember correctly. And he had the idea to make this boat with a blunt nose that would actually be more capable of holding a larger cargo than you know, a small boat with a pointed nose. And he made the nose come up like a spoon in the bow. And uh, that helped shed the waves that would normally have splashed over the bow. But it was a very useful type. And they, um, it, there were probably tens of thousands of Garveys built in Bargain Bay. So and the type is spread worldwide. That's a perf another perfect segue to uh, the other books that you've written, because I know you're a sailor and there's a lot of boats that are specific to Barnegat Bay, right? Including Silent Maid and the Cat Boat? Yes. yes. Well, Cat Boats, of course, actually came to Barnegat Bay from New England. Okay. And then probably from New York, where they spread as a really uh, practical fishing boat for a small crew. Um, the cat boat in Barnegat Bay became quite a famous tool. Uh, it was used in the old hotels as a means of taking people out for a sail. It was used for fishing, both 
in the coastal Atlantic Ocean and in the bay itself. And that's how, of course, a lot of the food got to the hotels. It's a single, a single mast, a single sail, with a mast way up in the bow of the boat, way up in the front of the boat. And usually in the early days, it was a gaff rig. It had a, uh, a boom that stuck out the back of the boat and the sail was suspended from another spar, another wooden spar that was pulled up toward the top of the mast and carried some of the area of the sail much higher than it would be on a, a uh, pointed bow. Um, I'll show you Silent Maid, which was the cat boat that my family owned. And you can Hi. see the gaff. Hello, I'm still here. <laughs> you see the gaff and the mast being way up in the bow of the boat. This was built by an Ireland Heights resident, um, Edwin Shuttle, who was a paper box manufacturer back in the, uh, got his father's business back in the latter part of the 19th century. And uh, they, um, he built the Silent Maid as a means of built uh, racing and beating all the other cat boats in Barnegat Bay, which for a run of three seasons, he actually did. He was Bay champion for three years. The boat itself um, was built in 1924 and sailed parts of eight decades before being turned into a museum piece. Um, a number of years ago, uh, Peter Kellogg, a very wonderful, um, socially responsible um, entrepreneur in Chesapeake, excuse me, in the Barnegat Bay watershed, slipping there to my old Chesapeake roots. <laughs> That's okay. but, um, he uh, actually approached me at the uh, uh, launching of the ACAT uh, book. The ACATs is a class of racing cat boats that were very popular, very high end and very fast racing boats. And um, he, he actually got me started on writing this book. And uh, it takes the, uh, the history of all seven families that own the Silent Maid, including my own, through their um, their lives up until the time they bought the, the cat boat. And then they sold it to someone else and that life is reviewed. But in the book, I review a tremendous amount about Barnegat history. And I dig, delve into many elements of the Bay history that were not touched in close heat. See, some of the, uh, some of the um, geological history, some of the meteorological connections of how the Bay's winds operate and why cat boats were particularly suited for the Bay. And that, uh, that whole, whole process was um, uh, a four year labor, again, a labor of love. And the book was published uh, by Fisher Gate Publishing on Kent Island in Maryland. And you get them on Amazon, you can get them from Peter Kellogg, you can buy them from me. I was just going to say, where can we get your books if we're excited about reading the rest of them? <laughs> so well, Down the Shore Publishing, of course, right? I'm sorry? I, Down the Shore Publishing published yes. your book, Closed Sea, yes. and then um, mm -hmm. who published uh, Silent Maid? Silent Maid was published by Fishergate on Kent Island, and it's fishergate.com. And uh, you can buy the book there. You can get it on Amazon. Um, if you want a signed copy, you got to buy it from me and I'll sign a copy and send it to you, um, you know, for four bucks. And uh, How can yeah. someone contact you? You have a website or an email? I have an email, Kent Mountford at Chesapeake, excuse me, that's an old one, Kent Mountford at gmail.com. Awesome. All right, so those are, those are a lot of the questions I had for you, but everyone is excited and dynamic in the mm -hmm. chat over here, so. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to put them in some kind of logical order. Paul uh, Bologna is asking about privateers um, and I guess probably asking about how if you touch on them in more in Silent Maid because I know you do touch on them a little bit in Closed Sea. No, I don't actually. Um, a friend of mine has written a book on the privateers of the New Jersey coast during the revolution. His name is Donald Shomet, S-C-H-O-M-E-T-T-E. -E. And you can Google him and Google the title of the book. It is a fabulous piece of work. I mean, it's like five or 600 pages and it's extremely detailed on the uh, Battle of Chestnut Neck and all the, all the interesting things that I touched on in, uh, in the early, uh, early book, Close Sea. But I can't compete with Don, he's, uh, he's written 20 books. 
And uh, that's a really good one, Paul. And Don would be pleased to have a few bucks in her. He's retired too. So uh, I've got a few questions that have come in earlier and are coming in now. Um, and so the first thing I'll ask is, is your Rutgers thesis available to read online somewhere? I don't know about online. It's uh, certainly put in the, um, um, it's in the Rutgers University Archives. Um, there was no online when I was in graduate school and no, on, no online at that time in any, any sense of the word. We had, uh, for my dissertation, we had a computer which was the size of a small hotel and it had huge air conditioners on top. And all of my data was put in, um, in punch cards and fed to the machine again and again and again until I got it right. <laughs> that is, I mean, it's, it's still really cool to know how much you accomplished with, you know, it being a totally different system. Let me expand uh, on the dissertation. Um, Mike Kenish, who was a Rutgers professor, I think he just retired recently. Uh, Mike put together a book called The Ecology of Barnegat Bay. And uh, the, the bulk of my work was summarized, essentially written a paper or a chapter in that book. But um, I don't believe the actual statistics and whatnot for the power plant study were available. And um, I continued the same work um, in, in, in Chesapeake Bay with the same kinds of statistical approaches. And we demonstrated the effects of power plants, which um, are damaging to phytoplankton. That can be good or bad because you know the too much phytoplankton is not good. Anyhow, I'm sorry so, to run in there. No, it's perfect because a lot of the questions uh, people are curious about the ecological side of of what's going on. So one of the questions here in the chat um, from Margaret is, um, uh, can you talk about the evolution of eelgrass in the industry and and how it was a hundred years ago versus now? And I know the book kind of goes over. Um, you know, the harvesting of salt hay and things like yeah. that. So can you speak mm -hmm. on that? Well, um, eelgrass is a funny one because we can't necessarily blame all the eelgrass problems on um, what humans have done to, to Barnegat Bay. Eelgrass is a cooler water, um, well, I guess we can blame humans, can't we? Uh, cooler water um, plant. And the Chesapeake is very near the southern limit of eelgrass natural habitat. And it's been dying back in the Chesapeake. And this probably is occurring as well in Barnegat Bay as, sorry folks, global warming approaches. We've had the last decade has been among the warmest months, excuse me, the, the summers have been the warmest months in history really for the, as far as weather records go back in, um, in our region. So the warmer the water gets, the less healthy eelgrass gets. When humans also add nutrients to the bay, um, this makes a lot of other things than eelgrass grow. And if you, if you go up to some place like Cape Pogue, Pogue, Pogue Bay, P-O-G-U-E Bay, on the, uh, on the west side of Martha's Vineyard, there's a beautiful bay in there that has some of the most lovely eelgrass you would ever see in the world. This is um, remote from most kinds of pollution because it's just a little island out in the middle of uh, Block Island Sound and the Vineyard Sound and what have you. And uh, so the eelgrass is in perfectly good health there. It's also one of the largest scallop fisheries in the Northeast. Um, if you go to Barnegat Bay, we have a very slow turnover of water from the bay. The, the inlets are very small relative to the, the size of the bay, so the water stays in there for a long time. And when this water is contaminated with nitrogen pollution in, in particular, um, the water sits there and it grows all kinds of organisms, many of which stick to the surface of the eelgrass blades and essentially block sunlight from them. So that's one of the major problems that the grass is losing the light that it needs to, to grow. Similarly, if you have a lot of plankton in the water, the water gets murkier and that uh, also blocks light, making it hard for the eelgrass to survive. It looks like um, Rupia maritima, which is a widgeon grass to the hunting community, um, in the upper bay might have been doing better. That seems to be about like it was when I was a kid. 
but um, it's a, um, a more opportunistic plant. It grows when it can, hangs on when it can't, sets a lot of seed, regrows in another year. So it's, um, it's a little bit um, more tolerant. Um, there's another one, which another plant, which was probably in the upper Barnegat Bay, uh, in the more fresh portions around the Matitikonk River, it's called Xenichelia, and it's called horn pondweed to the, uh, the, the common name. And that was probably far more abundant up in the upper portions of the bay. When they opened the Bayhead Manasquan Canal, uh, there was enough salinity that came in from that, that that may have knocked down the abundance of Xenichelia, the horn pondweed. So that's three elements for three different uh, grass species in, in Barnegat Bay. That's perfect. Um, and as another perfect segue, we have a question about um, the relationship between uh, eelgrass and oysters. Uh, I know when I'm educating, uh, we tend to have to start with one topic because we really want people to understand the depth of it. But truly, all these ecosystems and, and animals are all interconnected and totally dependent and, and, and related to each other. So definitely if you can touch on how the two populations and their growth and decline have affected the bay. Well, I, I may be wrong on this, Grace Ann, but um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, they would do both do well in an estuary that was clean. Oh, for sure. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> they really don't overlap in habitat naturally. The okay. oyster needs something hard or firm to sit upon in order to grow. And in the Chesapeake, there were tremendous reefs of oysters where the oysters sat upon each other and the little baby oysters would grow on top of the grandpa oyster. When the grandpa died, there'd be more oysters and they just built up large physical reefs. Um, I was unaware that um, those ever occur in Barnegat Bay. Um, There's well, a thriving uh, oyster industry though many years ago. We don't, we don't have oyster reefs that are from the from the old day there's certainly oyster reefs being built again and there's certainly the um oyster the the agriculture you know groups that oyster, are yeah, growing oysters um but particularly the question specifically was asking about the relationship and and i correct me if i'm wrong but i i answered in the chat before um that the algae being filtered out of the water by the the oysters could potentially protect the eelgrass maybe a little ways down because they're not shading out the the eelgrass blades. So that's certainly true. In, yeah. in Barnegat Bay, you would need a lot of oysters to do that. And I know, I think it's Jim Merritt who does that oyster culture down around the, uh, the, uh, the Sedge Islands. Um, he, um, he's trying to do the best thing he can there. But um, when oysters are put in a plankton rich community, they suck out that plankton. We have a, a game we play with students in uh, Chesapeake Bay where you bring a tank of dirty water in, you put a few oysters in it, and you have a tank of dirty water with no oysters in it. And in an hour or so, they clear the water out for very well. And one of the things, of course, they, uh, they process this stuff, they turn it into their own fecal material and excrete it. But the stuff settles to the bottom and pretty much stays on the bottom. So it's not up where it's causing plankton growth. So that's a very real, a real improvement, absolutely. And that, um, um, some of the estimates have been that the original pre-colonial oyster beds in Chesapeake Bay would filter the bay, are capable of filtering the bay, in three or four days simply by pumping it through the oysters. And there are many organisms, including in Barnegat Bay, that um, filter the water just as oysters do and, you know, take it and make it into their own tissues. And many of those are valuable fish food. They are the kinds of things that the critters we eat come along and munch on. Well, worms in the, in the benthic community, the bottom community, um, that's um, extremely rich stuff, which is where Nancy got her professional start, looking at the benthic community in Barnegat Bay. So she could do a lecture on that too. Uh, I'll have to invite we'll bring her in a little later. <laughs> I'll have to invite her back. I've already got suggestions in the chat of more things we can do with you and Terry. And <laughs> now I know Nancy can jump on. Um, that's awesome. Uh, so for she's, those you were currently working in Barnegat Bay um, for the state of New Jersey. Uh, they, she does the benthic analyses that are uh, following the close down of the uh, Oyster Creek nuclear power plant. So um, they're looking to see what kinds of changes occur in the bay. And that gives you an opportunity to look backwards 
and see what kinds of effects the uh, the plant might have had during its um, gosh, half century, you know, 1970, I guess seven, 1970s when the plant came online. I may be wrong on that. I think Willie can jump on and tell me for sure because he's he's very good with the knowledge and history of the power plant. Um, Willie is so, a smart man. What? Yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kent touched on a few things that I just want to plug in. Uh, Reclaim the Bay is a program that's a part of the uh, uh, Rutgers Barnegat Bay Shellfish Restoration Program. Um, so Reclaim the Bay, are, have they have 10 upwellers throughout the entire Barnegat Bay. They're all on uh, docks and those upwellers uh, take care of uh, juvenile and baby clams and oysters and scallops and the volunteers come out and uh, basically care for those juvenile shellfish and then they are used for education and cast throughout Barnegat Bay. And so um, Kent was referencing Jim Merritt and his work uh, at the Sedge Island Natural Resource Education Center which is in the middle of Barnegat Bay, right inside of the Barnegat Inlet. And so Reclam has for many years spent a lot of time at the Sedge Island um, location, educating and uh, putting the clams under clam leases to be raised and then cast into the bay. And so those are, that's one of the most well-known shellfish restoration programs in, our, in the area, I would argue, because it's so public facing. Um, but there's lots of uh, oyster restoration projects going on, um, especially Mordecai Island, which is on the backside of uh, Long Beach Island. And there's a whole group uh, dedicated to that, including some of Reclaim the Bay's members and many more projects um, for sure. So um, I just wanted to put that plug in for, for that because those issues are so, so, uh, Prevalent. Um, we've got a question from Judy, and she's asking. Um, we're going to switch gears all together to talk about um, anything you can give about the uh, Sibagaygi plant in Tom's River and how that might have affected um, Barnegat Bay, the Tom's River, and and she's asking if it's been resolved and has dumping stopped. I wish I could answer that. I, I had no idea that was going on back in my youth, and um, it turned out that I mean that's a pretty good case for cancers around Tom's River and west of Tom's River um, that were related to that thing. I, I know very little about it. I'm not a toxicologist. I'm a naturalist and an ecologist. I should know more about it. And it's, it was a serious, serious issue. May, uh, may I jump in here? You may. It's Billy Moore. And not only do I remember it, but um, if you haven't read the book, Tom's River, I've heard it, of it, yes. It is a mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize winner. Yes. Excellent book. Mm -hmm. And it goes into the entire history of what Sibagard he was doing. And there was another company too. It was United something or other. And I don't, I forget what, but. Um, Carbide? My feeling is that I still wouldn't want to drink Tom's River water. But I do recommend the book. It's very, very well known. Um, it was actually fronted on our uh, Chesapeake Bay um, journal, which is a, a, a newspaper in the region that I wrote um, almost 200 columns for. And it was profiled as a, uh, a light, or like a book of the month uh, back roughly when it came out. And um, um, I'm buried in many other issues. I, I could die before I read all the good books I need to read. <laughs> but thank you for that. That's very helpful. Billy, that's an excellent plug. And for those of you who would like to read that book, I did put it in the chat really quick. I attached the Wikipedia link so that you can decide who you purchase from. Um, but Tom's River is a really excellent book and it was eye-opening at the very least. Maybe we'll make that the third month uh, reading book and see if we can get that author to, to speak or someone from Oceans of Hope. Um, oh, Britta's already, yep, Britta's, Britta's on the thought. Let's add it to the next month um, for sure. So we can probably go on a lot about Sibagaygi. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just scanning the chat to talk about, oh yes. Um, so just so you know, the Tom's River will hopefully be a movie at some point, Danny DeVito oh, purchased cool. the film rights to it. So yeah, yeah. Um, if you don't get the chance to read the book, um, you'll get the chance to see the movie. Uh, so. Back to uh, the ecology of Barnegat Bay, a question that came in before 
uh, we started the event, someone was asking about the population of blue crabs and how they have changed over, over time. Obviously, um, a lot of people perceive that the blue crab population has declined and certainly um, scientists have you know, also backed that up. So if you can talk on anything you know about that. Well, I know about the Chesapeake and this, uh, last year was a, a relatively poor year for blue crabs. It's one of the major, well, probably the major surviving seafood industry in Chesapeake Bay with the loss of the oyster and many of the fisheries. So um, the crabs are, um, crabs are very dependent upon uh, near shore circulation where the baby crabs are actually um, spawned in the estuary, taken out into the, uh, into the coastal ocean by the tide and they mature a little bit and then are brought back in. And the idea is that they come in with the tide, they're clever enough that they go down to the bottom with saltier water, they come in. And the idea is they're supposed to go into beautiful, uh, beautiful grass beds and you know, get their, their growth process going, shed their little shells and turn into baby crabs. Um, that's a very weather dependent process. And as major weather patterns change, including those related to uh, global warming and climate change in the broader sense. Um, this is a very valuable process. And if over harvesting occurs in a bad year, you lose the recruitment and that doesn't, uh, that doesn't bode well for another, another year. Um, I haven't seen the uh, winter crab fishery data for the uh, Chesapeake, so I can't say whether it's estimated to be a good year or a bad year. And I don't know what sampling is done with blue crabs in the Chesapeake. Is there an, an, a continual monitoring program year to year? Uh, yeah, so biological monitoring? There's a few different scientists, I, I believe, working on it, particularly uh, Paul Jivoff, who is at Ryder University. Uh, we have invited him to speak for, say, Barnegat Bay's annual meeting in the past, and yes, Barnegat yes. Bay Partnership just invited him for their own uh, science talks. I don't know if they recorded that meeting, but Paul is dynamic and often has some really great info um, with, to do with his research. Save Barnegat Bay does a study with students in and outside, inside and outside of the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone. And within that study, blue crabs are part of that data set. Um, so it's certainly not, uh, it's not that long. It only happens during the summer, but it does happen every year. And the study has been being done for quite a few years. So. Uh, if anyone's interested, you can check out Save Barnegat Bay's website and uh, check out the student reports for the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone uh, team projects and the blue crab data is in there. It's, um, there's a lot more data than that, but some things if you're curious to read for those of you who want to know more about blue crabs um, in Barnegat Bay. Let's see. Um, so uh, that's pretty much, I covered all the questions that I had from the chat and from the uh, pre, you know, before we tuned in, uh, the Facebook Live didn't work like I wanted it to. Oh, so, too bad. Yeah, it's okay. We'll post it again, and hopefully, people will ask questions, and I'll I'll follow up with you. Um, but there are still fifty five people tuned in here on the Zoom video. So if anyone would like to uh, send me a question in the chat, or uh, unmute your mic and or raise your hand so that I can um, have you speak, so that you can ask a question. Uh, let's see, I've got Robert Rogers. Um, did you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, you're a very good speaker. Well, thank you. I, you have a wonderful voice uh, as well. Um, I, I, I missed the very, very beginning of the uh, presentation, but nevertheless, um, what, what is the primary source of pollution in Barnegat Bay? A very simple answer, people. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, um, Ocean County had maybe 20, 30,000 people. And um, you could find uh, cardwood, cordwood being cut from the Pine Barrens up on Route 70 where most of brick is currently covering the land. Um, when I came back a number of years later, I went to one of the headwater tributaries of the Matitikonk River, and it was full of shopping carts thrown there by careless people and kids. 
Um, I believe a population somewhere in the order of half a million people in the summer now. We all poop and we all flush and we all, I mean, those of us who are homeowners, fertilize our lawns. We all sit in traffic on the highways. <coughs> That's where it comes from. Okay, so uh, based on what you said, um, it sounds like uh, so sewage coming into the bay and also fertilizer, correct? Well, sewage is no longer discharged to the bay directly. Fertilizer is one of the problems, but uh, fertilizer, equivalent of fertilizer, comes from the rainfall. It comes from the air washed out of our automobile exhaust. It comes off the land much more rapidly now. Instead of going into forests, it goes into, uh, into streets and storm sewers and whatever and gets to the bay much more rapidly. Okay, um, uh, point if I may. I was uh, at a restaurant in New York City about three years ago and I met a gentleman who is a landscaper in Florida and we were talking about a few things and I don't know how we got into it but somehow I mentioned Barnegat Bay and pollution. And I just met this guy kind of off the cuff. So certainly it was important to me to bring, bring, bring that up. And maybe he was from New Jersey years ago. In any event, I, I, I of course said that I, 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 you know, I feel bad about the pollution in Barnegat Bay et cetera, et cetera. Don't remember the conversation exactly. But the point is, I, I brought up to him, I said fertilizer, and he goes, yeah, fertilizer. He had, he had so, some, some sort of background. I don't recall exactly what. But his point was, being from Florida, that maybe he said universally, universally in Florida, or at least the area that he was from, that there was some sort of a mandate, I'm par paraphrasing what, what, what he described, or, or law, whereby the fertilizer that they use down there, in either in his area or across the whole state, I believe he said was an organic fertilizer, as opposed to the stuff that you're able to get in uh, I guess hardware stores, Home Depot, ba 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 ba, anywhere, anywhere you you buy it here in New Jersey. So, if it sounded super interesting, what 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 he was saying, and and the the the, the idea of what he was saying was that, and he is a landscaper. It sounded like he had some insight into it. That if people would use organic fertilizer as opposed to what uh, that people normally use, especially, obviously, especially in New Jersey, especially at the Jersey Shore. So at any rate, bum, 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 cutting to the chase. Uh, my thought is that people in New Jersey, especially around Barnegat Bay, whether it be on the bay, especially, it could start there, uh, property owners on the bay directly, but also within a, a mile, the shore towns and beyond, use or organic fertilizer as a, and, and maybe the state can mandate it uh, by law or county or town, towns as a start. Um, you sound like you're, you may be the expert. What do you think, sir? Well, I'm certainly not the expert. Um, uh, Willie DeCamp has spent, um, I think um, probably the better part of his life <laughs> spending, and I mean really wearing his life away, uh, trying to deal with nitrogen uh, fertilizers in New Jersey. And he's, he's got some legislation that was passed that was one of the, uh, you know, one of the really uh, the very beginning of this whole process. Um, organic is fine. Um, I wonder if they're talking about something like milorganite or uh, a soil amenity as opposed to an absolute 
uh, nitrogen phosphorus fertilizer. I, I'm not certain. Uh, I, that. I, I believe I believe he was he was talking. He was saying uh, what led me to believe was that if you went to a store or where where a wholesaler wherever he gets his fertilizer, that that it's it's a bit, it you know it's available it's available or mandated to them by by Florida or at least in the community where he lives. I don't recall exactly where, but it was a, a major major coastal community. Yeah, well, well, that's certainly useful. Uh, Willie, do you want to comment on that? I see you've come up. The, it, it is really natural to, to for that question to come up. Um, I've, I've wondered about it. But it turns out that when fertilizer is organic, it can still be highly water soluble. It can be, really be bad news for an estuary like chicken poop, I think is wa mostly water soluble. I'm not sure about that. So the, the key thing is how, how readily does a nitrogen source dissolve in water? And um, with a lot, a lot of organic fertilizer, it dissolves right away. And that, in fact, a couple of years ago, we had to kind of do an emergency intervention because the New Jersey legislature was, was starting to buy into that idea. It's just organic, just sounds good. And we had to talk them out of, of, of a law that would have permitted any organic fertilizers. But, so just but, to but tie, it's, just it's, to tie all the, the pieces together here, um, Save Barnegat Bay, uh, Willie DeCamp is on, he's the, been the president of Save Barnegat Bay for a very long time and helped, uh, well, not help, but pretty much did along with others pass the strictest fertilizer law in the nation uh, for the whole state of New Jersey, which mandates how much fertilizer can be put on the lawn, uh, what uh, the product has to say on the packaging. So it has to have slow release nitrogen in it, uh, which is the essential component because um, what everyone's been um, kind of alluding to is that that stormwater, the rain is carrying that dissolved, you know, that nitrogen that's dissolving from the, from the fertilizer into our Barnegat Bay watershed and throughout the, the streams and into the bay. So um, the, the talk about organic versus um, inorganic and, and uh, produced versus, um, you know, slow release or pellet, you know, there's a Nitrogen and, and fertilizers are really, really complicated um, topic, and it's um, it it deserves its own talk altogether, frankly, because it, there's so much to do with it. Um, so I just want to um, give. There's another question that came on uh, that I just want to get to because it does directly relate to the book. Um, one someone was asking. Uh, it's di completely different train here. Um, someone was asking if you spoke with Rob Tunstead, the soil scientist. Um, he would have probably been a. He's a, currently a soil scientist, uh, but probably at, much after you writing the book. If you spoke with him about the inlets that were created and destroyed throughout time, um, and that because so the person alludes to how in the book you were kind of saying that they were maybe there, maybe not there and some, obviously they were there, but there were time periods that you weren't totally sure of. Um, so they're asking if you were able to speak with Rob about that. No, I haven't, um, uh, but there, there was, it was interesting to me and one of the inlets was at one point called a new inlet, obviously, because it had just occurred. Uh, before we leave the fertilizer thing, I wanna say, I think the key is slow release. Um, that, you know, if you get something that doesn't dissolve and run off with the first rainfall, but lets the stuff come out over a period of 30, 40 days, you have a much better chance of controlling it, turning it into the grass that people want or the garden produce they want, as opposed to uh, having it go into the bay. But uh, uh, there was an inlet up near Mandalokin. And um, I think the marshes, the marshy islands off Lavalette were probably about where, uh, where that inlet was back in colonial times. And it surprises me how close it was to where the inlet opened during Hurricane Sandy, right at the foot of Mandalokin Bridge. I thought that was kind of, you know, well, uh, you know, the Neptune is trying to say, I want an inlet there, <laughs> whatever you guys think. Can so, you? Yeah, the, the inlet story is fascinating, it really is, because they came and went, and Cranberry Inlet is a, a prime one because, of course, it was a commercially valuable inlet, but uh, they're over the centuries, there were many inlets that occurred before we even knew, uh, you know, that there was a Jersey coast here. 
Can you speak to the, the, the digging of the canal? Because that, uh, from what I understand, changed the ecology of the Northern Bay a lot. It and did. Even the it, really, it really changed. It was a big fresh, almost a freshwater lake at the, at the, uh, at the, the end of the 19th century. And the proposal to dig the Maniscon, Bayhead Maniscon Canal was actually back in, uh, in the 1830s. It took them a long time to get together before they did anything. And then they, they finally you know, dug a channel in this little creek that went right by the Johnson Boat Yards and uh, joined Maniscon River. Um, it didn't work because part of the, uh, part of the problem was you re reduced the flow of Maniscon River. A lot of it then was spilling into um, to Barnegat Bay and the pressure for Maniscon Inlet to stay open was reduced significantly. And this is one of the reasons that the inlet closed even after they had um, after they opened the canal. But once the uh, Corps of Engineers stabilized Maniscon Inlet with the big jetties that are right behind me now, that go out a thousand feet into the ocean on the south north side, um, that really made the inlet maintainable. It still has to be dredged almost on an annual basis. But when the jetties were put in, it actually closed again and it had to be dredged out. I believe there's an aerial photograph of that, pretty dramatic with the dredges working their way through the sand as they were opening the inlet. And in 1931, I think was the final opening and it's been open since. But that, uh, that change of salt water coming in to the Manasquan River at the same time the tide is going out in Barnegat Bay, there's about a five hour difference between Manaloking and uh, Manasquan Inlet. So that the, the suction that goes through pulls an awful lot of salt water in, pushes an awful lot of Barnegat Bay water back out again. And uh, that keeps the canal open, it keeps the inlet open and in, in, you know, in the long term scheme of things. But that brought a lot more salt into the upper part of Barnegat Bay. And as I said, it was approaching being a freshwater lake. It was a good place to build boats because you didn't have worms. And uh, the um, Morton Johnson Boat Works uh, benefited from that for many, many, many years, many decades. Uh, Jim has a question. Uh, Jim, if you want to unmute your mic. Uh, thanks, Grace Ann. Ken, you wrote a book called The Closed Sea, and Barnegat Bay certainly is a closed sea, uh, closed in a lot of ways and more so every year because of people bulkheading the shorelines. Mm. My question is, with the advent of living shorelines as more and more a way to deal with bulkheading in some of the other areas, could you speak a little bit about that and what you think about the future of living shorelines is in Barnegat Bay? Well, if it's a situation where sea level rises at a modest rate, then you can have the plants build their own peat and their own substrate in a time frame that is sufficient to match the rise of sea level, um, you know, the movement of sea level. Um, if you're in parts of the Chesapeake where I live, um, sea level rise is occurring and combined with um, subsidence of post-glacial reduction in height of the, the land surface. Um, it occurs so fast that you can't use the, the, uh, the living shorelines in any place that has any wave action at all. That's a problem where I live. My wife and I have been living with the loss of our property for four decades. But it's a, it's a wonderful program. Of course, that's all natural stuff that goes, goes in. Have you been doing any of that along the uh, Sedge Islands in, in your own um, life? We have, we, we've put in a living shoreline using the resources working with DEP and the Barnegat Bay Partnership, uh, several other organizations. We tried a couple of years ago, instead of using the plastic bags to hold oysters for the reef to break the wave action, we started using burlap bags and we just did that last year. So it remains to be seen how well that will hold uh, with the currents and the issues that we have. Yeah. And Grace Ann alluded to uh, the uh, Reclaim the Bay is doing a lot in a lot of different places around the Bay. Most importantly, down in Mordecai Island off of Harvey, Harvey Cedars, they're really working hard to, to try to save that little island. So 
it is going on. It's a, it's a struggle and we're all trying to beat back the, the wave action on the bay. And there are a lot of places that need it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, strategies have been tried a lot in the Chesapeake is called offshore breakwaters, where they put a, um, essentially a, a stone revetment or other material, they've used bags of sediment and whatnot, uh, to break the wave action. And behind them, the uh, sediments tend to build up and give a quieter environment where, uh, mm -hmm. where that, uh, the growth of grasses and whatnot can occur. And right near us, there've been some areas that are really quite, quite attractive and very nice habitat. So offshore breakwaters is one of the strategies. They're sort of like a dotted line of stone revetment along the shoreline. And they break up the wave action and the waves wrap around the ends of them and build up sediment behind the uh, stone revetments. Or silt, so, but they're not revetments. That's a um, perfect segue to Judy Wagner's question. She's asking about uh, sea level rise, which we kind of touched on with the living shorelines. But if you can talk about the um, role of barrier islands, I think that would kind of be interesting because she alludes to how the bay won't even be there to save someday. Obviously, that's many, many hundreds of years in our future as the barrier islands retreat. But if you can speak on that. Yeah, well, barrier islands do retreat. Um, of course, at the, in the late Pleistocene, after the, uh, excuse me, the Pleistocene, after the glaciation began to melt across the upper half of the world, um, the sea, the sea coast was 100 miles to the east of us. And barrier islands formed as that sea level progressed, migrated to the west. And there have been maybe as many as 100 different barrier island systems that have built and destroyed, changed inlets come and go that came at us from a great distance. And I discuss a little bit of that in, uh, in the Solemn Maid book because barrier islands are not designed by nature to be there for very long. And the more natural they are, the better they withstand impacts like Hurricane Sandy. Um, I didn't see Island Beach move very much, but it took my house away here at Manasquan. So uh, it's, uh, it's very serious and will continue. It will do so on the west shore of Barnegat Bay as well, because um, inundation of the marshes creeps its way back into the edges of the pine barrens, the pine forests, and uh, slowly kills the trees. And you have ghost forests that develop in some areas. We have an awful lot of them in the Chesapeake. And um, we, we're losing islands as well, uh, just like Mordecai Island. We are losing James Island and Barron Island that were islands that had villages on them, that had whole communities and um, watermen communities and farms and even numbered roads in the road system. And uh, James Island in particular is about ready to disappear. The Corps of Engineers is bringing in uh, a dread spoil from the approaches to Baltimore Harbor and putting it on the, around, around the edges of those islands behind stone revetment. And that's the idea they're gonna to try to save these islands. This was done for those of you who are interested at Poplar Island and um, at Hart Miller Island, two locations in the Chesapeake, where you can see the results of those after decades and after a couple of decades of deposition and environmental building. They seem to work and offer some prospect for dealing with um, sediment that is, needs to be gotten rid of somewhere. That's not the problem here. You need more sand. And we are running out, um, running out of sand offshore to re-nourish the bee shoots here. I'm not sure how many times that we'll be able to do that in the future, if that's clear. That doesn't really answer your question, Jim, but um, I understand. It, these these issues are so complex. You can't yeah. ever expect one person to understand every every angle of one bodies of water's ecology. Um, if I'm not mistaken, is there anyone else that has a question for Kent before we uh, wrap up here? I know there's no questions left in the chat. Um, I'll give it a second to give anyone a chance to unmute. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Of course. Oh, Billy's on. Good. Um, I was just wondering, I unfortunately got in late and I had asked a question online about um, uh, the effect of closing of Oyster Creek 
uh, is there much known yet about what the effect of closing will be and it, is it expected to be beneficial? Well, um, I don't know if you were around when the plant started. Yes. The bringing <laughs> of salt water up uh, Forked River and pumping it back out of Oyster Creek made Oyster Creek a saltwater habitat. And um, it destroyed all the docks and whatnot that were in that creek. And that was pretty, uh, pretty dramatic for the people who lived along that. So that's one thing that would happen, that the creek will come back to its natural flow and natural, um, natural salinity. Um, the te higher temperature water that was discharged into the bay had a number of effects uh, during the winter um, sometimes um, migratory fish like Menhaden would stay in the warmer water thinking, well, it's going to be a good year for us, you know, we're really in good shape. And they would turn the power plant off for maintenance and all the fish would die and be just no way for them to get away. So um, those are two things that will stop. What I'm wondering about is what the devil do they do with that plant? I mean, that's a, a lot of that stuff is really hot radioactivity. And the plant discharged small but measurable amounts of radioactivity, as do nuclear power plants in, uh, in the Chesapeake as well, in Susquehanna and in, in the main stem bay itself. And uh, I'm wondering about that. Will those, will those effects continue? But um, I, I think it will be beneficial making the bay a little more natural than it was. It also depends on what they do with the land around the Oyster Creek plant. It'd be really nice to see it go back into pine forest and cedar swamps and whatnot. I know when the power plant process began, they cut back a large amount of uh, original um, white cedar bogs that were along the, uh, um, along the edges of the streams. And uh, if you could reestablish those, those are really good habitats for, uh, for absorbing nutrients coming from the land. Uh, those swamps are very effective nutrient sponges. Same with marshes, anywhere marshes can be built. They're very, very effective at that. Uh, I think someone unmuted. Uh, maybe one last question. Uh, Charlie Gartland, did you have a question? Yes. Could you just repeat Kent's uh, email address, please? I will do it. Kent Mountford, K-E-N-T, M-O-U-N-T-F-O-R-D, as a single word, and it's at gmail.com. Thank you very much. What did you sail and where did you sail in Barney Bay? Oh, I sailed a whole bunch of boats. <laughs> I started with a, uh, an eight foot pram with a rig that my father and I built in the cellar. I had a, a 15 foot sneak box. Uh, Nancy and I, when we got together, we had a, a 20 foot 1924 cat boat that was actually uh, built by one of the men that worked with Edwin Shuttle who built Silent Maid. I sailed with my father for 12 seasons on Silent Maid, which was that at one point the largest cat boat in the world. Pretty cool. And um, I sailed um, a yawl that we bought down in uh, um, Cedar Creek for four years. Um, her name was Semba, and uh, she was a 38 foot, 36 foot, two masted sailing vessel. We sailed a uh, Choi Lee, Offshore 31 Catch. All of these boats have come and gone in Barnegat Bay. And we had for 30 years another yawl, a nimble yawl designed by Ted Brewer, from which Nancy and I sailed 25,000 nautical miles. Many trips through Barnegat Bay and up and down Delaware Bay. And um, <clears throat> in my 82nd year now, I headed into uh, 82nd birthday in two months. No, 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 don't talk about it. <laughs> we, um, we bought a small powerboat. And uh, sailors are told that this is the terminal trawler, it's before you croak. And so I thought the wind gods might not be looking favorably on me. And I put a sailor and rig on this little trawler. So we still have a sailboat. And there are probably 10 small sailboats tucked in between. That is awesome. And I, I just got into sailing myself, but I'm learning just how wide the sailing community is in Barnegat Bay and how important sailing is to the history. Um, Kent, thank you so much for tuning thank in you. with us and, and sharing your wealth of knowledge, not just about closed sea, but also about the ecology of not only one, but two different bodies of water that are insanely important to the, you know,
coastal ecosystems of our ocean. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the participants that stuck it out this long and, and um, contributed really deep, you know, deep questions. And it's been truly the best Barnegat Bay Zoom meeting I think we can ever have asked for. Um, if this was fun for you and you were excited about reading more books to do with Barnegat Bay, uh, you can join the Barnegat Bay Book Club. Uh, I have the main source of all of what we're doing is on a website called Goodreads. Uh, you can also keep in touch with our website and our Facebook page. Uh, next month, we are reading Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy. And that book goes into uh, the importance of native plants and their relation to insects and how native plants and the way we've changed the landscape of uh, our planet has affected the ability of different ecosystems to survive. So uh, Doug is well, well known in our community for speaking on native plants and has spoken before. So we're excited to have him uh, join us next month. So uh, thank you again for everyone to tuning on. Thank you, Kent, and um, all of those of you who participated. And uh, stay in touch. If you need anything at all, reach out to me directly at education at savebarningatbay.org. I thank you, thank you too. Everyone. And um, I'm very touched by the interest that everyone has had. Uh, it's really nice after half a century to have this book come alive again. Thank you all so much.